Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Natural Fertility with Dr. Jane. Today I am here with Sandy. Sandy, thank you so much for being here. You have a fascinating story. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. I love to collaborate and be on this side of the podcast. I'm an interesting little weird kind of <laughs> natural person because I started in the allopathic world. I mean, I think some a lot of my nurse practitioner friends are I did that, but I am a PA. So I was started as a general practice PA about 20 something years ago. A long time ago. <laughs> it's been yep. a while. And I started because I was very young at the time. I was just early 20s. I was going to medical school. My father-in-law told me not to. He was a medical doctor retiring. And he said, don't do it. That's not what I would do now. So I didn't know any difference. So I went to PA school and I don't, I'm thankful for my training as a PA. I love patients and we kind of joke as PAs that we're patient advocates because that's kind of what we do. And we're, we're really yep. focused on education. So I started my world as a general practice PA and thinking ignorantly that the practice would run very much like my physical exam class did, which was we're looking at the eyes and the fingers and the, all the things and trying to see what diseases are underlying there and helpfully prevent them, right? That's, I thought was what medicine was like. Yep. And it wasn't very long into my practice experience that I was like, I'm just prescribing drugs or surgery, you know, and, and the drugs weren't great. They always had a side effect. The, the specialty yep. I started in was orthopedics and we yep. did not have other options. Like there were no other standard care, standard of care options. And I was like, this is not right. There has to be other things, you know? And so I kind of got a little disillusioned. I jumped around and did female health for a while. I did some surgery there. I did some emergency medicine and ultimately I decided if I was going to deal with medicines, I was going to deal with medicines that absolutely were needed and were short term type of things. So I ended up getting a second master's in anesthesia. So I could justify those drugs because I don't think anybody I know wants to have surgery without me. So that's where I ended in, in my medical career. Now, during that time, I personally had my own health issues. I had some autoimmune problems. Of course, in my training, I was always like trying to see what the new most cutting edge treatments were. A lot of them, in fact, all of them, I pretty much said, I don't like the side effects. I'm not taking that. I'm not doing that. So I just dealt with it. And it was pretty debilitating. After anesthesia school, I had my third child and I had a real bad flare of my autoimmune problems. So I went back to the doctor and they were like, well, we could put you on methotrexate, which is the chemo drug, right? And I was like, but that's what we were doing five years ago. Nothing's changed. And they're like, no. well, we have some new biologics. They're basically new chemo drugs, right? Immune modulating, immune suppressing drugs. And I was like, no, that's okay. And so I was just suffering through it. And then somebody introduced me to some natural products and I was like, that's not really going to work. <laughs> okay. So I Medicine makes you a little proud. And I was definitely that. I was like, come on, I have $150,000. No, actually, it's $3,000, $300,000 worth of education <laughs> like yeah. in medicine. Like these natural things are not going to do anything. I've studied this stuff. Like, and I was so, I was so prideful, but I was like, I'm, I'm desperate. This is painful. I was in a lot of pain. So I tried and I was just not expecting them to work. And they did. Wait a minute. I have basically four years of pharmacology, yep. a lot of drug experience. In that, in that, you learn a lot of cellular metabolism and cellular mechanics and things like that. So I was just kind of like, how, how is this working? So that opened Pandora's box. And it was a blessing because the timing of that was in preparation for what I didn't know was coming, which was that child that I had, the one that I had right after anesthesia school. He ended up developing Lyme disease several years later, probably about seven years exactly. So I had been on the natural health journey, researching, understanding, learning, basically doing my own curriculum yep. and diving into a different way of thinking of healing for about seven years by the time he got sick. So when he got sick, of course, I didn't go in the direction of all the, the doctors because his first symptom was ADHD. And I was not doing that. <laughs> I was not doing the medication. My first son, who is now 23, 
he was the product of all my medical training and he was on those drugs and he yeah. has his last labs were still not very good. And he's, you know, yep. he, he just has a lot of side effects from the drugs that I get him, got him on as a child. So I was determined to not do that, to kind of figure out what the problem was. And we did some dietary modifications. We started, we were doing gut work and his ADHD symptoms did get better. But when they did, it was like he, now he could communicate how he was feeling, which was my joints hurt, my stomach hurts, my knee hurts. I don't feel good. And we're talking about a seven-year-old who just previously was outside all, all the time outside, playing, running, jumping, tra trampling, swimming. The, you know, we have two big dogs and you run, play fetch. I mean, just the active, yeah. normal. A boy, yeah, a seven-year-old yeah, boy. boy. <laughs> yeah. So that was like, that's odd. Most kids don't have pain like that. They shouldn't have pain like that. And it was really like debilitating to him. It, he would just have to lay down. And I was like, okay, so now we have to figure out what was going on. And I had stumbled into this tiny little book and I wish I could remember who wrote it, but it was just this small little book written by some functional doctor who was like yep. ADHD symptoms. Here are all the potential root cause problems. And he basically gave you the bullet points of like what the major root causes could be. Of course, diet problems were a problem. Of course, we fixed that. Then there was environmental issues. So mold and things like that. And then of course, he went through the rest. But mold caught my attention because I lived in Georgia at the time. <laughs> and Mold is endemic there. So we we have mold everywhere. It's just, it's in the air outside. So it's not like if you're dirty, if you have mold, it's just part of the environment. You got a nice humid environment, just fosters it. So I thought I'm going to take him to an environmentally specialized functional doctor. So I did. And he was very helpful. That was my crash course, my first crash course in all the functional labs, which I now do in my own practice. Yep. And he did have a ton of mold. And it turned out he also had Lyme. Mm -hmm. And so thus began the process. Now, this guy was wonderful in helping identify the problem, but he was no Lyme specialist. And Lyme is pretty complex of a bear. It can cause effects every single organ system. The bugs hide in biofilm. It's just, it's a, just a booger yep. bear. It's not easy to, to deal with Lyme. And, you know, healing is is complex and and painful. He just didn't, he didn't have the grasp on that. So I kind of looked for other you might, people. I'd love yeah. for you to elaborate a little bit more just to provide that knowledge and education of how to actually find out. And I know you're going into it in terms of all the stuff that it takes to. Yeah. So Lyme is interesting. So I had, my, Lyme caught me off guard because I, I rem, I was one of those nerds in PA school that instead of doing plastic surgery, which a lot of people did as their elective rotation, <laughs> because they wanted a job in plastic surgery. I went and did nephrology because I was like, mm -hmm. it's like internal medicine on steroids. You learn about the kidneys. You really get to know what the body's cellular situation looks like. And what was fascinating to me is the guy I rotated with always tested people for Lyme. And I was in a place that was not necessarily known to be endemic. He's like, oh, it, it can destroy the kidneys. And there was all over in that with cardiology. He also, if he was rounding on a cardiology patient with sudden cardiac issues, he would also test for Lyme, which mm -hmm. I thought that was the first clue. I was like, that's not what I learned about it in the books. It's a global problem. And what we use in medicine as our test, which is always, it, it has a false positive of 50% 50, 50 or more, more if it's been chronic. Huge. Yeah, like that's terrible. That test is over 50 years old. I think it's something like 65 years old. It's really old. Yeah. <laughs> and out, it's absolutely outdated. We have so much more, so many more specific ways to test for peptides and things like that and immune responses now, whereas we just have this old Western blood technology, PCR, that's just it's just old and it, and it's his Western blot and PCR was negative, but it is only going to result in a positive. If you really have an acute situation, meaning it's a recent infection within the last six to eight weeks. Now who, who is going to go to their doctor in Georgia saying, well, my kid just feels a little, he's a little off. He feels tired. He's got joint pain and muscle aches and, and they're going to test the Lyme. But they're not. <laughs> Nobody never. does because they're no, so vague symptoms. They may do it in, in New Hampshire. My mom lives there and they may do it there because of the the awareness the physicians have about it, but but they won't do it the rest of the world. Like it's just not normal. Yep. So it's missed a lot of the times, which means then it goes into a latent phase. So you have phase one, phase two, and phase three of Lyme disease. You have the 
the acute, which is very symptomatic, joint pain, fatigue, fevers, just it feels like the flu. And sometimes the bullseye rash, not always. And a lot of times with kids, they'll get one, they'll get an itchy rash, they'll hide it. That's what my son did. He's like, yeah, I remember getting kind of a weird round rash, but I didn't tell you about it. And we're not like over there looking at him every time he's taking off his clothes. It was like up in his upper leg or sure. somewhere. He, he mentioned it like years later when I'm talking to him about the bullseye rash and educating him. And he's like, yeah, I have one of those. <laughs> Great. Thanks so know. much for telling me. Yeah, yeah. I, know. I know. Oh yeah, yeah. I had that all the time. It's like, come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's rare, but phase two is even worse because phase two, which is like the latent phase is starting to just, it's called the disseminating phase, right? It spreads everywhere. It's, it's colonizing in all the places that it likes to hide, which a lot of places are like the heart, the thyroid, the joints. Those are the typical first places that the Lyme likes to colonize and start building its home and building biofilms over it to hide itself from the immune system and its attack. And that phase is pretty much asymptomatic. I would say it's vaguely asymptomatic, but in reality, it's it's not. You're getting these weird symptoms. You're getting like emotional symptoms like i'm depressed and i'm never depressed i have such fatigue and i'm never fatigued like my joint hurts and then it goes away and or i feel palpitations and that's better all the tests come back normal because nothing's wrong because it's in the disseminating phase and that's really stubborn and very difficult and that's the phase where people are like i just i think i must be crazy and they really do get in that phase and they get I hate the term, I hate to say gaslit by doctors, but it is a reality. Oh, uh, huge but, reality for people. Yeah. And I don't think I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to the medical practitioners out there that they're not meaning to, but they only know what they know. They only have the tools they have and yeah. they're not taught anything else. So yeah. I can tell you, I personally said, I don't have anything else to offer you to patients that came into my office that had weird symptoms that I had no explanation for after many, many tests. So yep. it's just, you know what you I know. Always say, I always say it's like, you're not asking for the wrong thing. You're asking the wrong people. And it's yeah. not to like, in terms of the training, I, I always, I never blame the doctor. You blame the system, right? right? It's like, you look at the education, you look at the working hours. If I had a hundred patients that I was seeing a day or 50 patients I was seeing a day, it's like, yeah. how I are you have... supposed to provide? Yeah. Like you yeah. don't have the energy or the capacity to be able to deal with this case that's coming in. That seems healthy. Yeah. Otherwise to be like, well, something is like, I'm going to yeah. dig in for this patient and I'm going to do hours of research, like yeah. eh, very unlikely. Do you want to financially invest in your phys physicians to allow them to have the opportunity to do critical thinking with the knowledge they're given? I like to use this example, Ben Parson, he ran for president, but that's not what I'm, why I'm, he was actually a very well-known surgeon in mm. the field of pediatric neurology. He was a neurosurgeon and what struck me about his story was he was a, a neurosurgeon in the 60s, 70s, 70s and 80s, I would say. And in the 1980s, we had a different medical system. My father-in-law was also a surgeon at the time. You you got paid for your skill and your knowledge. And so you could see complex things and think about them. And he successfully performed the very first twin, twin, conjoined twin at the brain separation where the children lived. And the only Amazing. reason he was able to do that is because he had time where he wasn't busy, busy doing busy work, seeing patients, rap, rap, you know, trying to bill and make money. He was getting paid well by the Johns Hopkins. I think it was Johns Hopkins. He had a good salary and he saw complex patients and he operated on complex patients, but he also had time to sit yep. with information, to think about the patients, to plan for those surgeries because he wasn't stressed on the financial side. Like the doctors do need to be paid appropriately, but that is not in their power. That is not the way it's going. Doctors are paid less and less every year and yep. your healthcare is reflecting that. <laughs> You know, yeah, they just have to, for sure. they still have the same bills. They still have half a million yeah. dollars in school debt, you know? So, you know, you don't I love them. that you say that though, because like I, the way that I run my program, I'm very protective of how many patients I see. So like, I only see 30 patients at a time. And then mm -hmm. unless they have graduated and they've moved on, yep. I don't take any more because it's not just the time together. The time together is maybe an hour a month, mm -hmm. but it's the time away that allows me to actually say, I'm going to 
block time and think about my case and see what's going on. And so thank you for saying, I couldn't have articulated it better myself. My patients are renting space in my brain and yes. a lot of the times in my heart as well. A hundred percent. You start to be desensitized in, in the space of fertility. Like I have patients coming crying all the time on every yeah. single appointment. Like I'm crying with them if they're my patients half the times. A hundred percent. I mean, that... To do that, that twin, twin, conjoined twin separation, not only did he have time to think through it, it was, it was think and thinking through yep. it, hours at home thinking through yes. it, that he went, yes. I know the solution. I know why it keeps failing. And then he had hours to practice with teams like anesthesia and cardio surgery and bring them all into the OR and practice the surgery before yeah. performing the surgery. That's hours of time where he's not actually getting paid, quote unquote, to do the surgery is time where he's getting paid to think sure. through and successfully do it. Yep. And it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. When you look at an athlete and they do something really well, you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's hours of practice and dedication. And that's mm -hmm. the same with clinicians. So then we talked about Lyme and first stage is acute. Second is disseminated and latent. And that one has a weird, it can last for two years, six months, 10 years. So, the, so there's like this wide range of where, how long disseminated Lyme stage two Lyme lasts. I've seen people who've had it, were in that stuck stage for about 10 years on average is what I'm seeing with those people, but it can be wide. And that, that's why they feel so crazy because it's been 10 years of going to doctors. Oh, you're crazy. Oh, you're depressed. And now they're on now they're on a Prozac or yeah. Xanax or something. And that actually does cause problems in the brain. And it makes it hard to use natural products to help recover the brain. It's it's a little tricky. So that's that's the unfortunate side of that. But this third stage is, is really the phase that people die from. I mean, up in the Northeast, they're aware of it and they see cardiac failures from patients. So this is this phase where the conduction systems start to go awry. You get weird heart arrhythmias and and that's what kills people with Lyme. But you also, it affects the nervous system. It basically causes like a, a demyelinating picture. And I know there's a big fancy term, but it just means that the, the, the conduction material that sits around the electrical elements of your nerve is, nerves are starting to fray. It's like the rubber on the on your electrical cords are starting to fray. Now in medicine, a demyelinating syndrome is, we only have a few and then we give them, the, we give them diagnoses names, like, I don't know, like multiple sclerosis, that's demyelinating. Guillain-Barre, that can be demyelinating, cause destruction of certain receptors, right? So they get labels in medicine, but we're seeing the same problem from Lyme disease. It causes demyelination. So there is this question like, is Lyme the root cause of things like MS? There's a discussion. Ask an old neurosurgeon, he'll flat out, but there's yep. a big conversation going on in the, in the Lyme world. Is that really what's going on? And the symptoms are very similar. So what those symptoms look like now are neurologic. Now conduction systems, like I said, with the heart, you get arrhythm arrhythmias in the heart. You get neuropathy, you get pain and electricity in the legs, you become very, very sensitive to environmental toxins. So we have toxins all the time, but thank God most of us have healthy nervous systems that don't aren't sensitized to all of that. But if you feel every electromagnetic frequency around you, your whole your body- That's overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. Like you are running, mm -hmm. that's a fight or flight state. Yeah. You become, my son, he, even organic foods, we would put it, like he would take a bite, like thinking we're like, okay, maybe this will be good. He'll put it in his mouth. He didn't even have to swallow. <laughs> He'd be like, no, I, I can't. I yep. can't. Or we go by a power station and his nervous system would just shut shut down. He's better now. Like he's doing really, really well, but there was, he still has some sensitivity to electromagnetic frequency and smog. We let him join the, the air, air, civil air patrol. And he wanted to, he really wanted to do that. And he wants to be flying airplanes or whatever. He's 12. So he sure, was so yeah. excited. He worked really hard and he, you know, this is a huge thing because at, at his worst, he, we were carrying him to bed because he couldn't walk up the stairs. Like he was sick. He couldn't move his legs. He just had so much fatigue. He'd sit outside and watch, sit in the backyard watching people play, kids play, but say, I, I just, I can't, I can't play. I yeah, can't. it's heartbreaking. Yeah. So, and he knew it and it was very, very sad, but he, he trained and trained and got ready for the Civil Air Patrol. He was so excited. And then they had the first meeting on an Air Force base and we got there and he started to turn green. 
and his legs started to get weak. <laughs> and he looked at his dad and went, I, I can't, I can't, I, be, I can't here. be here. And this is after treatment. So he still has a little bit of repair to do, yep. but as a rule, he's working out. He's fit. He's, he's, he's a different child, For but sure. he's still sensitive to EMF. So yep. anyway, that's third degree Lyme. So Lyme in an adult, you know, that could be a really tremendous fatigue. I cannot get out of bed. I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> And yep. my heart races all the time and, you know, my joints Joint hurt. Yeah. yeah. So that's tertiary Lyme. And now that is harder to deal with because we're dealing with bugs that have affected and infiltrated the nervous system. So to kill them, that's where we're going. And that causes inflammation. So the, the healing process is certainly as painful as the illness itself in some degrees for short periods of time, but it's a process. <laughs> it's doable. So yeah. It's, I mean, it's a lot of work and I, I share this a lot on my social media because I think everybody grossly underestimates what it actually takes to heal. Mm -hmm. And so I share a lot of stuff that I do from like the parasite cleansing and the saunas and the red light therapy and just like general supplement routine and water filtration, air filtration, you name it, because people think I've changed this and then I'm good. I did yeah. the whole food 30 for, I did the whole 30 for 30 days, nothing changed. And I'm always like, yeah, but do it for three years, you know? And so, mm -hmm. and then when you're getting into the weeds of actually dealing with something like Lyme, it, yeah, there, it's going to be a lot of things that are uncomfortable, but, you know, I, I always say the discomfort outweighs the, Hey, I just don't want to be here anymore. You know? Yeah. Even 10 years ago, I said, if you aren't detoxifying, I used to say this to people, I'm like, if you aren't actively doing detoxes regularly, you are behind Yeah, because we are so bombarded in our environment between air, food, and water yep. with toxicity, radiation, EMF. I mean, just, and then on top of that, we have inherited damaged genetic code from parents that have been exposed to the same thing. So we have less capacity to handle that. So we see more disease earlier on. And that's what you're seeing. I mean, we see kids who are sick. Kids aren't supposed to be sick. Yeah, <laughs> like, not like that. Not, not like, like, like the, we're seeing. Yeah, childhood cancer should not. It just shouldn't exist. They have. They're supposed to. They have the most robust immune system. They're the. They're supposed to be healthy. That's what kids are supposed to be. They haven't had the time to accumulate all that toxicity that causes cancer, unless somehow they've gotten it somewhere else, i.e., their parents. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So they inherited toxicity from parents, and they have inherited damaged genetic material. From their parents so they just can't detox as well and so that's that's part of the problem and that was a huge thing like when i was helping my son recover from lyme the first place i had to work was to improve his genetic expression of detoxification do epigenetic work you know yep and and that made a huge difference because then open drainage then he started to clear toxicity and then I could deal with the Lyme and just yep. opening that drainage and just being able to clear that toxin from even just from the biological waste of the bacteria in his body. This is a hard question, but I see this all the time because in infertility, there's a lot of blame, like self-blame and self-worth. But when you have sick kids, it's really easy to blame yourself as well. Oh, yeah. And how, like, how did you handle that? And went through that because it's hard, you know? Yeah, I have five kids. So my first two, I had them while I was a PA, followed the standard of care, fully vaccinated. You know, I think my oldest had, you know, now I, looking back, I know what it was. Like we sure. had moldy, yep. we live in a beautiful house. It was a beautiful house, but it was an old house in Georgia. And it had mold. I mean, it had mold everywhere. It was old. It lived, it's a city that gets flooded. So he had all kinds of airway infection, colds. He had an antibiotic, I think, three times in his first year. Like every six months, he was getting the antibiotic. And he was on albuterol. And he got all the things. I think he had a claritin, which I don't know if anybody knows this, but those drugs will disrupt the pH of your gut predispose you to yeast and candida in your gut and then cause all kinds of problems. He was on that like forever. He started on ADHD drugs by the time he was four and a half because he was off the chain. And that kid was my kid who by age nine or 10 started having strep throat annually, just annually having strep throat. Okay, now another antibiotic. Okay, now. So he never got past the strep throat. Then one year after that, studying natural health now, I was probably into my year three of, okay, I really am confident in this stuff. This is this is another way to deal with, heal the body. Yeah. He got strep throat. 
and he got a really bad case of it. And I mean, I was like, okay, better, you know, like, because I still had the fear that was embedded in me as a PA. Like, you don't treat strep throat; they're gonna get heart disease. They're gonna, you're gonna cause all kinds of rheumatic issues because they're you're not dealing with the strep. You need to kill the strep. So that's what that's what we're taught, you know. And so I was I was battling that internally as I was watching my kid have a hundred and two or three fever and not giving him a Tylenol because I, I knew his liver was wrecked and not giving him an antibiotic, which I knew would shut the problem down like that because it did every time. Instead, I made him gargle with myrrh. I made internal, a bunch of herbs that were natural antibiotic remedies. And it took a little bit of time. It didn't happen like this, but he was better within two days, but I had to watch and suffer through and pray. But you know what happened? The next year he fall came around and didn't get strep throat and he hasn't had it since. So oh. his immune system was able to go, wait a minute, this is something I need to get rid of. <laughs> and now and he knows how to do that. Now go back and I go, I wonder if he had strep and we gave the antibiotics. I think he had it as a kid too, like a little kid before he turned four and before I put him on ADHD drugs. Yeah. And I think of pandas like pediatric autoimmune neurologic disorder associated with strep, right? That that disorder very commonly causes a tremendous amount of issues for children yeah. that are that are like emotional or concentration. They can't focus or they suddenly, sweet child suddenly becomes a combative child. Sweet teenager suddenly becomes a depressed and suicidal teenager. That kind of picture yep. can often be associated with pandas. And I wonder how much of that was related with him, but it doesn't matter. So I tell that big story, that long protracted yep. from birth to the last time I treated his strep throat because I had to wrestle. I was like, you know, it was then that I was also starting to yeah. question the one thing a medical person never questions, which is the the childhood schedule that you go for your well visit and you get those things that they give you. <laughs> Yeah, the childhood vaccination schedule. Yeah. You can say it on here. <laughs> sure. So you yeah. know, you cannot challenge that as a medical practitioner, or you are officially a quack. So officially, young. officially, and you know, so it's not something that I promote loudly amongst my medical colleagues. But I started to have questions about it around that time. I was like, every time that I, because I did my pediatric rota rotation, and, and one of the things I wanted to know is understand why we did those vaccines the history of it. And nobody gave me those answers. They just kept giving me the schedule. And I was like, I just, I want to understand it because this is an important thing we're doing. It's part of what we do in pediatrics. You know, I wanted to know as a practitioner, medical practitioner who might do pediatrics, like, so I could educate the patient, but the doctors didn't, they didn't know. Yep. And so I remember going back and thinking about epidemiology just a little differently and the timing of the introduction of those and just being like, oh my gosh, wait a minute. And then watching them increase the number of the, you know, the doses and it just, it's outrageous, you know? So then I started going, man, I really messed up as a mom. You know, I, had to, I had to grieve it. And I think that's an important thing to do. I think that we forget to let people grieve that. We just say it's better and move on, but it's okay to grieve it. It's okay to grieve yeah. things that are bad and wrong and let your heart grieve. It's just yep. like a loss of a death of something. Something just yep. died. So and, I, and like a new version of you is born. It's that resonates with me so much because I didn't like I didn't do any prep for my firstborn. And I feel like that pregnancy was it was fine to the outside eye, but it was a like a train wreck, mm -hmm. for, especially mm -hmm. the labor and the postpartum, the recovery and like the depression that I didn't even really admit to myself. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until not only until I had my miscarriage, like there was a big grief of like not appreciating the pregnancy, but it was once I had my second and the connection I had with my second and how, like just how different everything is, how my husband and I feel. It, we say like, mm -hmm. we had her because this, like we didn't feel that love and overjoy when I, my first came. Same, not for yeah. another <laughs> reason, because I just, I, I was so tired and so depleted and yeah. I didn't do anything to prep. It took me, another two years to let, like I had some energetic work done and a lot of counseling to like, why can't I let this go? Mm -hmm. You know, why can't I let this forgive myself mm -hmm. for not knowing I didn't know, you mm -hmm. know, I didn't know any better. Cause if I knew better, I would have done better, but there, there was very much a grieving process and it's yeah. like giving yourself time to do that. It's so important. Is, 
It's so important. Yeah. Look, I was a medically trained PA. Both of my two children had all of their shots, multiple antibiotics. When I, after my second child, I got breast implants. I mean, I, you know, I messed up and then yeah, I had three sure. more children with breast implants. In, and, and I think that my th- third of those had some liver issues because my breast implants were ruptured. One of them was ruptured. We all work on the knowledge that we have at the current time to do the best we can, Yeah, but it's not, maybe it might not be com- complete knowledge. So being an honest and sincere knowledge seeker is good, yeah. but also recognizing the fact that this is part of the human experience to to not know everything. We are not God yeah. and that we will unfortunately cause some damage in the process and that it's okay to grieve it. Like it's okay to say, oh, I wish I hadn't. Gosh, it should have shouldn't have been like that. It should have been like this. It should have. Yeah. That's right. You're right. Yeah. And it's okay to grieve that. And I think if you don't grieve it, then you're just trying to push past your emotions and that causes its own issues. So I, I start with, it's okay to grieve, go grieve it. And if it yep. takes you two years to grieve it, grieve it and talk to people about it. Talk to them about the grief you're having, yeah. but also remember not to get, let the grief dominate you. Remember to remind yourself of the truth that you yeah. are doing the best you can yeah. and you have tools now, right? Yeah. That's one of the things that I think we like to do is to give you more tools. Like the more, you know, the better you can do. Like, and the goal is that your lifestyle changes in, in fashion so that you can continue being a better you, better yep. mom, better caretaker, better whatever. Like, you don't, we're not in the, in the business of doing like the medical doctors, what you were saying about doing whole 30 for 30 days and it didn't work. That the problem is that not only are doctors trained in the quick fix mentality, but patients are too. So we have to get to the place where we really want healing and healing is different than a band aid. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, healing, I think is the, like it's driven by knowledge, right? You have to have this desire to learn how your body works, acceptance for the fact that it's probably doesn't work the way that you think it does, right? Mm -hmm. Like in three months, I'm going to be able to do, and it's like in three months, you're going to do some stuff, but you're not, it's the process is designed to be just because you're literally rebuilding your whole system. You're changing over cells. Your cells turn over. Like they die and get new ones. And as we die and get those new ones, those new ones need to be either going to be the same and more toxic, or maybe they're going to be just a little better able to handle stress and, and and toxins. And maybe the next line of cells are even a little better at handling stress and toxins. And so that's the idea. And that's why it does take some time. I always kind of give people a realistic idea of when they're, when they're working with me, it's, it's going to take some, depending on where they are. I'm like an average of 18 months, an average, you know, if you've been sick for a very long time, say two months per, per year of life that you've been sick. Yeah. It's how long it's going to take you. you My first child took a lot more Tylenol than my second. My second has maybe done a one dose and like that would even my husband is like, just give her Tylenol. It's like, no, just let her, like, I know it's a bad night of sleep, but like, let's just yeah. let her system figure this out. Mm-hmm. And like no teething stuff, no whatever issues. Mm-hmm. And with my first is like, I don't know what else to do. Right. And really right. it's a fear because there's a lack of knowledge or understanding or trust or all of the above. Yeah. And I mean, that's true for our own personal. Well, response. there's a lot of pressure because the think about unless you're around your holistic friends and they get it, <laughs> like, and, yeah, who is and like, who, yeah, <laughs> except if you're, just, if you're a practitioner, maybe, but that's it. So if you're just even having a conversation, oh, my son was sick. Is he better now? Well, I'm letting him ride it. You, they don't get it. <laughs> Like they're, mm-hmm. they don't get it. They look at you like, you're, I can't even have those conversations. So you feel kind of isolated in that sure. process because you're like, uh, I can't download. The quack. <laughs> yeah, I can't don- download everything I've learned in 10 years to you right away so you get what I'm, where I'm coming Yeah, but I do believe in like leading the way. This is where my social media stuff comes in. Like I, there was a post in this like it breaks my heart because it, and it's, it doesn't, and it, do, because I know that they don't know any better. So it's like, there's all this mm-hmm. tearing inside. I just use that as an, inform, a way to educate people, but you know, it's a mom, stay at home mom here's like decorating for fall. Mm-hmm. And it, she's literally just putting like Tylenol bottles and NyQuil and it's a joke, but I yeah. made another one. And I was like, here's how I decorate for fall. 
Yeah. Like here's my herbs that I use and here's the vitamin C and zinc and the probiotics and here are the foods that we're mm-hmm. eating. So when I scroll on that person's page and she has almost a million followers and I can't remember who it is, the next post is like, here's the candy that we take when we go on the trip. Yeah. And it's just like, this is insanity. You yeah. feed your children this much candy when you go on a trip. And I can see that they're young kids. Like I can yeah. imagine giving that to my kids and be like, yeah. well, let's get on a car together for seven hours. <laughs> yeah. But look, it was, it was hard because when I made the change, when we changed our whole lifestyle yeah. was when Steven was having his ADHD symptoms, six or seven years old. And my other two were like 10 and thir- 10 and 12 or something like that. Like they yeah, were older. That's hard. They were older. They're like, what are you talking about? They're mom? like, what do you mean? I can't eat my Halloween candy. <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> what do you mean? I can't have tomatoes right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what about spaghetti night? <laughs> like, what do you mean? You're going to throw half that food away. Yeah. They, man, they pushed back. They were, they were old there and they, you know, and teenagers too, right? Yeah. They were like, mom has lost her mind. <laughs> like, what do you mean? I can't take Tylenol. What do you mean? It was, it was a fight and it was my first, it was my first client, okay. but I had to learn how to tell a 12 year old hi. And yep. yeah, it was a, it was a major shift in our lifestyle. And then, and of course, when you make bigger shifts first, you become a little excessive, a little bit. It was your, yep. my, my kids were right to say that you're so weird. Like, I know. I, don't I know. Yeah. I'm Carrying sorry. Our food to our <laughs> friend's house when we're having dinner, cause we're not going to eat their food. <laughs> like just bringing our own water. I still do that, but like, cause I don't yeah. want to drink your water. Cause I don't know. You know? Yeah. It was a little off the top, but that's- I mean, I, I hope we are like, we don't live in this world for forever, but this is the world that we live in now, you know? I know it, it is. And that's the thing. So that, that ends up being the existential questions that come up. But why is it like this? I become like a philosopher for my clients sometimes. So, but why is the world so broken? But why are there so many? But why would they do that when they could do this? And I don't always have the answers for that. Hmm. But the reality is it is. Hmm. And we can decide to stick our head in the ground. And a lot of people do. They willfully yep. do that. They're like, this is so it's overwhelming too much. to yeah. me. It's too much. And then other people go, okay, so if this is the reality of my environment and where I am, then how do I function mm-hmm. in the best way in the environment? I mean, you, you can't fix the political system. You can't fix agricultural, the FDA or any of that. You're not yeah. going to do it. You can rally and you can support if you want it. It's just, you're not going to fix it. But you can advocate for your health. I, I, I don't think family. that's the place where you should be putting most of your energy. 100%. Let's just say that, you know, it's <laughs> that's like- That's a good way. <laughs> well, someone's asked me like, why don't you work with medical doctors and try to, because it's like, that's not where my energy is best spent. I know no. what they're going to say. No. I know what they're going to do. And it's like, you should be doing what they're doing. And it's like, yeah, or I could just make a name for natural medicine. I know. <laughs> Right. Like that's, that's what I want to do. And there's a lot of practitioners like yourself who are leaving the medical system because they don't like, they didn't get into, I remember I wanted to be a medical doctor because I had a class. It was on communication and healthcare. And I'm like, I want to be a different kind of doctor. Mm -hmm. I just didn't really know what that meant, but I Mm -hmm. knew that I already had experiences at that time, 18, 20 years old. I already had experiences with my doctor where I felt unheard, unvalidated, like, oh, yeah. it was just like, okay, I guess, like, what, what is it that you're doing? You know, mm-hmm. you're putting me on birth you spend, control. Spend yeah. a lot of time and you spend money and it's somehow a privilege for you to be able to see them. <laughs> I always tell people you're hiring your doctor because there's this, still this mentality that the doctor is king. And yes, they have spent a lot of time. I mean, yeah, you, you spend how many years, right? In, in yeah. how much debt and all that, like I mean, a lot of time to five years and $300,000 at least of, of my life and my money to get my education. So yes, I have some knowledge that maybe you don't, yeah. but that doesn't mean that you can't have that knowledge. Do you know that you can't think through it critically? In fact, you probably think through it critically better than I do because I've been taught to think it like this. You know what I mean? So it's, you can, you can fire your doctor. You you can find a doctor that is work that it's just like your lawyer. They can give you advice on what to do with your money and your trust and whatever, but ultimately you're in charge. You can fire them if you don't like them. (laughs) And it's, 
reality too. Unfortunately, we do have a problem with the number of people wanting to go into medicine <laughs> these days. So we do have a don't have a whole lot of practitioners and there is wait lists and things like that. But your wait list is for the standard medical approach, which yep. I don't know. I yeah, can go on it's, about it's that. really the way that we get out of this <laughs> of this mess. Yeah. And yeah, I, I educate on this a lot with my clients as well, because it's like, why well, eat healthy and I do healthy things? Like, why do I still have issues? And it's like, you're trying to implement the strategies that your parents taught you like mm-hmm. 30, 40, 50 years ago that mm-hmm. are if you don't smoke, if you don't drink and you don't eat processed foods, you're healthy. And it's like, that's just not the reality for our world today. Yes. And I find that that's important to educate. Like I educate my kids on this. My daughter, we'll go to Costco and she's like, hey, can we get goldfish crackers? And I'm like, no, she's like, yeah, but this so-and-so has it in class. And I'm like, well, you tell so-and-so that these guys are have chemicals in it and they're really bad for you. Yeah. And he's like, exactly. okay. Yeah. And like, I know. That's it. And like the conversation stops. It's not a, oh my goodness. It, like, I really want to have them. It's just like, nope, these are not good for you if you read. And then when she started to learn how to read, it's like, can you read the ingredients? And she's like, well, this is such a long word. I can't pronounce it. I'm like, exactly. So, yeah. Like, that's it. You know? So yeah. it's it, like, to me, it's not even an option to create this critical thinking in tiny humans, because that's the only way that I think you'll be able to decipher between like what's BS and what's real. Yeah, it is. It is a parenting opportunity to have them to learn at a young age from the beginning how Mm -hmm. to think critically. Like, let's ask a question. Let's do the the Socratic method here for a minute. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. My little kids come up to me all the time. Like, is this poison? I'm like, "Mm -hmm." it is. Yeah. (laughs) The little made good bars, they were giving them out in gymnastics and my daughter reads it and she's like, it says made good mom, but it's not, is it? It's so cute. I know, but <laughs> see, like, that's good thinking. marketing. And she's like, what's marketing? I'm like, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing. Like I wasn't thinking critically like that about anything that I was putting in my face. No. And so what a blessing. I tell this to my clients as well. Like, I know this is hard what you're going through. If you're a parent, and most of them are that I see women with children and I'm seeing them usually, but, and so I'm saying to them, like, I know this is hard. Like what you're going through is no joke, but your kids are watching you and they are learning. And that has a generational effect. Like that is going to change how they take care of their bodies and think about their bodies and value their bodies. Yep. And that will affect how they're so your, your suffering is not wasted. If you, if you go about it with the right mindset and the right heart and really work hard to to take care of it because it's worth taking care of. Right. It gives me goosebumps because it's like, I say that your fertility is your healing journey. Mm -hmm. And if you make it about that, then the pregnancy really becomes an empowering experience instead of a traumatic one. Mm -hmm. And really what I'm after is generational health. You can't, build that if you have no idea how your system works. Because when your child gets a fever Mm -hmm. and when you're scared and you're panicking and you have no idea what to do, Mm -hmm. that you just, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do this. I like, I get it. Why parents give antibiotics and steroids to their kids because they don't want to see them suffer. Mm -hmm. But it's having that courage to say, I'm going to learn this. I'm going to figure this out. And I'm going to, you know, and like I said, I'm going to be a warrior mother for my kids, <laughs> like, totally. yeah. like go to fight for them and fight against my own self if I have to, you know, that's the hardest battle <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah. The other thing that was with my work in anesthesia. And so there was, there's a part of my job that I thought was really interesting overlap with my practice, with my practice. So my son, one thing I noticed with him was he really got sick after an anesthetic. So mm. like it, like it, he had his ADHD under control, but his physical like he de- he decompensated after and that's when the Lyme really I mean I feel like that's when he had the symptoms from his Lyme exposed so I I remember looking back at this because I had a, a patient in the operating room like two years ago um, who they had some genetic testing listed I was doing a surgery I was doing the anesthesia for a surgery where they were basically taking out ovaries and all the things because they had developed a cancer an endocrine cancer a, like estrogen dominant cancer. So they were taking everything out. And so they had all this genetic testing and one of the genetic tests was the MTHFR gene showed up. And I thought, that's interesting. I don't normally see that. That was the only thing that showed up in her medical history was MTFHR. I was like, that's weird. I don't usually see this in 
in the hospital. I mean, I see that in my, my records in my clinic, but I really see this here. So I was yep. curious about it because I just written a blog about that gene because everybody kept asking me about it. <laughs> Yep. And it ha it affects anesthesia. So it affects how we clear our anesthetic. It has a pretty mm. big effect on that if you have that mutation. And here I'm thinking I'm having a crisis, like a, a ethical crisis. I'm going, okay, this lady has cancer. She's about to have chemo. And she has this detoxification gene that is off. And I'm about to give her a major toxin to put her to sleep. <laughs> so I was like, let me ask her about her anesthetic. How'd she know she had this gene? And she said that she had genetic testing done after her cancer diagnosis and that they told her she had that mutation. She didn't know what it was. She looked it up and figured out that that's probably why she had that cancer. I think it was breast cancer. And I said, yeah, it is probably why you had that problem. So I asked about other anesthetics. She hadn't had any major issues from them, but ethically, <laughs> I could not give her the standard anesthetic because I just couldn't live with myself knowing what I knew. Yeah. I knew too much. So I altered her anesthetic and I gave her a different anesthetic that's a little cleaner, a little less toxic, but it's just not something you can do all the time because the, the way I did their anesthesia was in a way that is extremely expensive. So <laughs> Hospital doesn't like when you spend extra money. So yeah. it's not something you can do all the time. So it's not like, and, and you, good luck convincing a whole bunch of anesthesia, anesthesia providers to, to change sure. their anesthesia yep. like that. They won't do that. No, 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 no. So, no. so it made me think, I'm like, how does this affect the brain? So I, anyway, it took me in this long, deep dive into yep. our anesthetics and what they do long-term to the cells. And there was... So much I unloaded there because the toxin is extremely toxic to the brain. So the longer you're anesthetic, of course, the more immune suppression you have, the more difficulty you have healing. And it really wrecks your mitochondria. And so anyway, that's that was something that... And then I went back and looked back at my son. I'm like, hey, that's when he started getting sick after he had that anesthetic. <laughs> and I'm like, that totally makes sense. sense He's yeah. done all this cellular stuff. But again, here I am. I'm, I've been in practice... In anesthesia for about 10 years by this point. And I had learned all the cellular mechanics of anesthesia, but I'd never thought of it from that perspective. Like, wait, what does that mean long-term? How does that affect the nervous system? And, you yeah. know, what was fascinating was the link between anesthetic, those type of anesthesia, anesthetic techniques and dementia. It was like a really high statistic. If you had if you were over 65 and you had a general anesthetic, I think it was 10% of those people would develop dementia within a year. Wow. That's how much of the brain. Yeah. That's crazy. So, and it was higher if it was like cardiac anesthesia. So you had bypass surgery or something because, of course, adds another layer. You've got now blood going mm -hmm. out of your body, all the things. So cardiac anesthesia, if you have to have bypass surgery after 65 years old, your likelihood of developing dementia in a year is like stupid high. It's like 20%, two out of 10. That's a lot, you know? That is a lot. Yeah. So it fueled my fire for the brain health prevention and the work that I do. And I'm still working on a, a full protocol anesthesia prep and recovery because there, if you, if you can optimize, just like you are saying about getting pregnant, if you can optimize before you get into a surgical situation before you have to be exposed to those necessary toxins. Remember they're necessary. Thank God for anesthesia. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. If we can prepare your body for it, that means you can clear that, that toxin much more efficiently. And then afterwards do some aggressive work to get that toxin out. It was a very unique toxin. You're going to protect your brain and nervous system a lot better. You're going to yeah. have a better outcome. Your immune system will recover faster. Your healing will be, you won't have that depression that's associated with anesthesia. <laughs> yeah. All those things. I think if we could just understand the consequences of our actions, it would Amen. be like in everything. Like I believe that the world is in a place that it is, is because we have dissociated the, how my actions have a consequence, you know, Amen. whether it's from like the consumerism, but like, I would have never thought about that. And even like you, how much knowledge and education and information and like clinical experience did you have before you made that connection? And then all the people with the dementia and it's, yeah, if we could just understand the consequences of not just our, this action, but like 10 years ago, 20 years ago and past generations, I, like we would just be in such a different place. And so, I mean, that's what I do. And I, it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing as well, <laughs> just in yeah. a different field. Yeah. hundred percent. I see plenty of patients in the, in the hospital who are just terrified and it's, understandable. I mean, Why? you're about yep. to give up your bodily sovereignty for, you know, 
how many hours and not have a clue or a voice. That's terrifying. I love my job in anesthesia because I do advocate for my patients and I am their voice and I do keep them safe. And, and I love to be, I love being able to do that. The other thing is that you, you want to be able to walk into something going, okay, I know I have to have X, Y, and Z done. I know I, I somewhat have an understanding that this may have a consequence here and a reaction here. I'm going to I'm going to see this as an opportunity to prepare. So instead of being scared and fearful, be yeah. feeling coming into it empowered is huge. That's yeah. that's what I want from parents. I want parents to go into being parents like for you with a, with feeling empowered because I I don't know about you, but I was like, what do I do? Yeah, no <laughs> idea. The first thing, like I couldn't believe that there was no that was my like I was like I cannot believe that nobody tells you anything. Yeah. about the experience you're going to get into yeah. until you're on the other side. And they're like, well, you just wait and see. And it's like, what are you talking about? Yeah. So, I mean, that's <laughs> how I became such an advocate because it's like, this is insane to me. Like, this is the biggest change that the female body will ever go through yes. in mm -hmm. the most defining moments for your, like some of the most defining moments for female health, as well as the defining moment for your baby's health. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we're tied, nothing, like just take a prenatal a couple of months before you start trying. It's like, yeah, really? and they make like, it that's seem... the best we can do. I think we can do better. <laughs> yeah. I, I think just because it's a familiar, I think the reason that we're so like in medicine about it, like, you know, everybody's been having babies since the beginning of time. It's everybody, cows have babies, horses have babies. <laughs> totally. Like, yeah. it's so natural. Don't worry about it. It's just, you'll be fine. But just because it's common doesn't mean it's not important that there are things that would be empowering to know. <laughs> For sure. like, you know. Thank you, Sandy. I'd love to tell everybody what you're up to and some last thoughts for people. So right now, we, my son and I, my Lyme kid, mm -hmm. wrote a book for kids because I think that, well, what, one thing that's really interesting about Lyme disease is that the most common population affected are children. Mm. And I don't think that people know that. No, they don't. It's, it's children who have the highest incidence, incidence of Lyme, which means that they have a longer effect of it. Like if you're not treating it properly and getting on top of it as a kid, your ramifications go throughout your life. So it's a huge thing. I was shocked when I came across that study and that was a medical medical study that I came across and it was like dated like 1999. We wrote a book called Kids Get Lyme Too. And it's, it's his, it's his story. And he, this kid, he's an amazing little kid. He has gone through a lot, but his, has a strong faith and his faith was formed and, and informed a lot through his process of healing. So he, he wanted to talk about it. So he talks a little bit about how his faith developed and how he had hope in the middle of his struggle, but it talks about Lyme and it gives some statistics and teaches, demystifies a few things about people that people might not know. Like Lyme is not just tick-borne. Yep. Mosquitoes can give it to you, <laughs> things like that. And that there are other ways to treat it and things like that. So it it's a kid's book. It's kind of geared toward, I would say at 10 to 12, even though it's written as a picture book. Most of the time, your picture books for little kids, the concepts are kind of complex so that's yeah. why we did a picture book but it's good for i would say 10 to 12 and for adults because i think adults will learn a lot from that process sure. so he dedicated the book to our we had a doberman who also get, got sick with a tick-borne illness right around the same time that he did and she got thyroid issues and got really sick lost a lot of weight and so they kind of bonded over that there were times where he would just snuggle on her bed with him with her and she would wrap her neck around him and just hug him like i know how you're feeling buddy i know <laughs> like so and she she passed away this this past september so we dedicated the book to her and it's coming out it should be coming out here in a couple of months um we're in the middle of editing all the illustrations and things like that but it's a great book for educating parents and kids about Lyme disease and give them another tool to be empowered to advocate for their children and hopefully feel not have a little less fear. You know, we're, I'm not here to provide a ton of information to scare you into action. I just want you to have the real picture. The more you know about what you're going into, the better you can prepare. I want people to have the full picture. The more information you have, the better you can advocate and protect yourself and really do preventative health. You know, you can turn your life around. You can find lasting healing and it will have, like we've been saying, generational impacts and it's life-changing for all, all people involved. So praise the Lord for 
the little bit of suffering we have sometimes, yeah. it is sometimes the motivation for huge change for many people. Thank you. That was amazing. Clean Living Basics, that's where people can find you on Instagram and Dr. Sandy on TikTok. Mm -hmm. We'll put those links in. And whenever you have the book, you let us know so we can help promote it because this was so wonderful. And yeah, you can find me at Dr. Sandy Bardron or beyondbrainhealth.com. And I think the the announcement for the book will be up there. Although I think the publisher is also doing a separate website. I don't know, but I'll link to it. So I'm excited about that and hope people will be blessed from it so that my suffering can bless others. See? Yes. <laughs> it's there amazing. You go. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks for having me. It was a really fun time talking. Appreciate your time.